Good afternoon, everybody. It's my very great pleasure to welcome all who are attending this event and to thank our chambers for organizing. I am Nigel Fleming, a member of 39 Essex Chambers. I regret that this is a virtual Zoom event, but at least it provides an opportunity for a larger number to attend. But one day, not too far away, I hope at least some of us can meet and share stories and memories about John as barrister, treasury, devil, judge, academic, and friend. Could I extend a particular welcome to Margaret Grace, John's daughter, and a thank you to her for the beautiful dedication and photograph in the book, uh, even a better photograph than on our slide before this webinar started. Going back to the photograph from Margaret Grace, if only the tie was in color. I, I have tried to show a bit of the same dress sense, accepting that my tie is not in the same league as a normal example of John Laws's neckwear. For this webinar, we have a sparkling <coughs> panel of speakers to launch the constitutional balance and to share some memories. The order of speeches is first Mrs. Justice Foster, then Professor Feldman, followed by Lord Newberger. Mrs. Justice Foster, Alison, started her legal career as John's pupil. She left us in October 2019 to become a judge of the High Court, having been our joint head of chambers for four years. Alison is very well placed to speak about John Laws, the barrister. David Feldman is Emeritus Rouse Hall Professor of English Law at Cambridge University and has shared the platform with Professor Paul Craig and John Laws on a number of occasions. John and David were colleagues in the Cambridge Law Faculty when John was the Goodhart Professor. Who better to speak of John the writer and John the academic? Finally, Lord Newberger, David, who served as a member of the Court of Appeal from 2004 to 2007, when he was appointed to the House of Lords, and then back to the Court of Appeal when David was Master of the Rolls from 2009 until 2012, when he was appointed as the first President of the Supreme Court. Who better to speak of John the Judge? My thanks to them, and also thanks to Hart for all their assistance and indeed persistence in publishing the book and in today offering the 20% discount for purchases to those who are enrolled for this webinar. The code that was on the opening slide, for those who didn't note it down, it's UG7, uh, and it needs to be used when ordering your copy. How many you intend to order is up to you uh, on the Hart website. As with many Zoom events, there is a question and answer function, which I should, I hope you will find at the foot of your screen. We expect there will be time towards the end to respond to questions or to consider any comments, anecdotes, or memories you may want to share about John. In my own personal tribute to the author, in addition to wearing what he might call a dull tie, I have exchanged my usual cup of peppermint tea for a glass of single malt whiskey with a little water. I hope John would approve of the distillery. Before I hand over to Alison, who will in turn hand over to David Feldman, I have a couple of quotes I would like to share with you. The first, the barrister's art practiced at its best involves an alchemy, an alchemy in which intellect and personality, logic and style combine to persuade what may be a reluctant, skeptical, and sometimes downright hostile court or at least it offers the best possible shot. This, for me, encapsulates John Law's The Barrister, particularly the words intellect, personality, logic, and style. The source of the quote, of course, John Law's himself, in a book, Cicero the Advocate. He wrote the epilogue, Cicero and the Modern Advocate. He ends the paragraph as follows, an instruction to us all. Budding advocates and mature ones should read him, Cicero, better if they do so in Latin. I'm grateful to Margaret Grace MG for the second quote. This is from The Guardian in December 1991, shortly before John Law's barrister and 
Treasury Devil, became Mr. Justice Law's High Court Judge. The piece is headed The Golden Rule of Laws and has this extract from John speaking to Radio 4 about the relationship between the judiciary and government. When one, as I do all the time, represents the Crown in court, one has an eye not to a war between the judges <coughs> and the government, far from it, but rather to see that the judges the judge has all the materials necessary for him or her to decide on a particular case, but also to see that the statute is properly administered generally for future cases too. So there is much more of a partnership than a hostility. The Guardian journalist continues, when as the appropriately named Mr. Justice Laws, he takes his seat on the bench, ministers will be well advised to follow the rule of laws. Finally, another quote from John. When I visited John, then unwell, confined to his flat in Pimlico, we talked, of course, about friends, about family, and about Greece, but we also talked about the work in progress. He was obviously frustrated about his inability to carry out wider research and the increasingly difficult process of putting his thoughts on the page. This, at least for me, is a book that remains incomplete, calling out for further debate and discussion. Let me return to the quote. After John died and to assist with final editing, MG very kindly sent to me a box of some of John's books, included, including in the box, Cicero the Advocate. In the box, there was also an A4 leather notebook engraved, as you will see, with John's initials. Only the first 50 pages have been used, and it starts on Christmas Day, 1997. And this is the first few lines, the first three lines in the book. Where there is law, consent is the major premise. <coughs> Where there is no law, force is the major premise. I don't know what you were doing on Christmas Day, 1997, I know I was not writing anything so profound. From New Year's Eve, 1998, writing this time in Durham, a few days before heading to Athens, and part of a lengthy two-page uh, passage, John says this, this, the difficulty is to find the true relationship between the rule of law and democratic power of parliament. That relationship is at the heart of the constitutional balance. Seems to me that the pages and those John, John's thoughts in those pages of his notebook may have formed the basis for his later writings and perhaps for the good constitution delivered as the Sir David William lecture in 2012 or the Hamlin lectures in 2014 and finally for the constitutional balance itself. <clears throat> Enough of me. I at last turn to Alison and as I said earlier Alison will then hand over to Professor Feldman. Alison. Thank you, Nigel. The thankless task of drowning other people's kittens is how book reviewing has been described. I could not find a less apt quotation for an evening considering a book by the late, great and very much missed John Laws. As I am sure you, his friends and colleagues will know, John adored cats. The frontispiece to the book says it all. In this evening's proceedings, I am very much on the kitten side of the ledger. It falls to me to share some reminiscences of him as a pupil master and friend, and I shall leave any drowning to others. I was with John as his second six months pupil in the mid 1980s. I was extraordinarily lucky. I was his only pupil at a time when he was the first Treasury Council, known colloquially as the Treasury Devil. That is to say, the government's main barrister, always traditionally and only in those days a junior not a silk so his practice was heavy varied and phenomenally exciting I realize it was a very long time ago but I have strong and very fond memories I divide them notionally into court and social as to court chambers was very small in those days I was number 18 when taken on we occupied cramped quarters in two garden courts second and third floors the rooms were small, the corridors narrow, and his consultations involving civil servants and government lawyers were often very large. 
cons started as soon as we were back from court. There were usually two or three, maybe four in an evening. There was a joke in chambers that when a government department came down to see John for advice, they were very lucky if their bottoms ever touched the seats. He was so swift, having one conference in and out, and the department waiting in the corridor ushered before briefcases were undone. John didn't generally make what anyone else would call preparatory notes. He had a stubby little pencil, which he held in his left hand, and he would scribble on the half folded old fashioned back sheet. Four, perhaps five lines in a really difficult case, six, maybe seven. In the first 10 minutes, he would explain to the department in question the reach of the problem, the answers to the issues raised, the answers to the perhaps more important issues they'd not raised and the action to be taken or not. It was very hard not to be in awe. John was almost always relaxed, always utterly courteous, and we laughed a lot, as I recall. Part of his relaxed regime involved the presence of the whiskey bottle on the corner of the desk at 5.30. Usually, but not always, this was after the last consultation had departed. John was an extraordinarily kind and inclusive pupil master who loved to discuss not set relentless pieces of written work, but the issues arising were discussed and the ramifications. And he allowed you to feel it was almost as if your opinion mattered. There was a memorable occasion for me, for me certainly, and not for him. I had produced a piece of paperwork and had written it out by hand as one did in those days and left it on his desk on a Friday. And I happened to come in on the Sunday and there it was on his desk. And I could see a thick red pen line from the top of the first page all the way through to the bottom, through the second, through the third, through the fourth, stopping somewhere on the fifth or sixth. I felt physically sick. I had misjudged everything. I thought pupillage was going reasonably well. How wrong could I be? I left in a haze of worry and doubt, realizing I was going to have to change my plans for the future career and not thinking very straight. So I came in on Monday morning. He didn't say anything. It's that bad, I thought. We were in court, lunchtime came, nothing. I spoke to him at the end of the day and I feel quite sick still remembering. And I remember it was a piece about contempt of court. My advice, I started, I, I was wondering what was wrong. And he looked at me completely blankly. You will know how John would look at you with one eye, but not necessarily with both at the same time. My dear girl, he said, and you will remember you are either my dear girl or my dear fellow. I've nearly finished dictating it. Speechless and immeasurably relieved, <clears throat> I left it at that. Self-doubt was not a thing familiar to John. The depth of mine would I think have been unfathomable to him, but I, I never forgot it. The characteristics of John, both as pupil master and as advocate were aside from the absence of personal doubt. Of course, he always had appropriate intellectual doubt but aside from that, they were persuasiveness and judgment. John was an irresistible advocate. He had the trick of making his explanation and solution to the case seem the obvious answer. Indeed, above all, he was persuasive. It's a quality that was very easy to recognize, but as I was rapidly discovering in places that he would call the Palais de Justice de Croydon Mags, it was practically impossible to emulate. I always tried to sit on the left of him in court as a pupil or junior, so I could see what the left hand was scribbling in pencil on the blank left hand side of his notebook as he, when he advocated, he always had his elbow and could gesture with his right hand. Usually what was written was only the very bare bones of the reply, answering the submissions made against him, which he may or may not have taken a note of whilst they were being made. He, could be, well, he often was gloriously indiscreet, sharing his views freely on the intellectual attributes of opponents and sometimes the tribunal. We would play, I am ashamed to say, quite openly multiple games of hangman whilst opposing submissions were being made. John was though a wonderful teacher by example and by discussion. And I recall some of the best advice he ever gave me when I was starting out to do government work. Concede the losers, Alison, always concede the losers. 
This protected his client both as to arguably fallible policy and protected them presentationally from ignominious public defeat where the arguments were stacked against. As a colleague, I recall John loved intellectual challenge. His room was just down the corridor. And I can remember again coming back from court one day doing the usual odds and sods in the admin list. And John had received an urgent phone call. He'd given urgent advice concerning a late night injunction the night before and certain repatriation of an asylum seeker who was actually in the course of being returned to Zaire. When I returned, he was ambling down the corridor and smiling. John did not pace. Wouldn't it be interesting, he said, to see whether the Home Office or the Home Secretary was answerable to an interim injunction. Maybe it should be set aside. It could be a question of contempt. John, of course, advised there was no jurisdiction to grant that injunction and the rest is history. Em and the Home Office will be known to every lawyer um, who's on this Zoom meeting. It's the one in which a member of the House of Lords, uh, you may recall, said that if John's argument were right, it would be as if the civil war had not happened. Turning from court to social for a moment, maybe halfway between the two, John as litigator, on the corner of the street where he and Sophie lived, a dress shop closed. The residents thought it was going to become a nice bookshop. The large shop sign that went up saying a Victoria Sex Centre and Cinema Club suggested they might be wrong. And John and others issued a motion for an interim injunction. <clears throat> Mr. Justice Vinelot said when granting that injunction and extending the law as to nuisance as it was then understood, Mr. Laws, a barrister, who lives there has described this area as having a marked and attractive village atmosphere. There was also evidence from a Mr. Andrew Leggett, Queen's Council, who had bought a house as a base for his son and his daughter and was particularly concerned that the new venture would attract, quotes, men of sleazy and unprepossessing mean. The shop didn't stand a chance against half the future Court of Appeal. And in Chambers, and uh, this is true, John was always referred to formally as Lord Laws of Village Atmosphere. I have said what great judgment John had and forensically he was second to none. Sartorially, it's fair to say opinions differ. I have never met anyone who dressed like John. The combination of stripes and flowers, possibly with a likely checked suit, have never been attempted by any other and will always be remembered as especially his. And I, I miss it very much. He would sometimes say, what do you think of this? When a particularly pungent combination was worn, but I knew that was purely rhetorical. Happily, what I thought didn't matter. And I certainly knew better than to say. John was, as those listening will know, enormously friendly and hospitable. But somehow, appropriately, on my first occasion that I went to supper with John and Sophie, with my then fiance, now husband, the enormous cat, called Geoffrey after the poem, I think, jumped into the soup tureen. It was completely unforgettable as a guest. John and Sophie just carried on quite normally once the cat had been got out of the tureen. The place of pussycats in their lives was quasi-religious and even towards the end in his flat, his not altogether friendly cat was on guard. His great loves were constant. Sophie, MG, the classics, his knowledge and love of would be another talk. His love of Greece itself, and of course cats, oh, and the law. John was generous with his time, with his lovely house in Greece, and in sharing his beloved family. John's family were his absolute bedrock, and he adored them. The wonderful words of introduction from Margaret Grace to John's book capture that sense. It is impossible to talk of John without thinking of Sophie and Margaret Grace, who became part of one's life if one knew John. And it was indeed an unforgettable privilege to know him. David, over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> John uh, was thrilled to be invited just after he retired from the Court of Appeal uh, to be the A.L. Goodhart Visiting Professor of Legal Science at Cambridge for the 2016 to 17 academic year. 
Uh, and he and Sophie threw themselves into the Cambridge experience. Um, and there was a reciprocal love for them from academics and support staff alike in the law faculty, Centre for Public Law, Robinson College, where John was a, an honorary fellow. Um, and as Goodhart Professor, John was given the opportunity to run a course of his own. Um, he had been unusual among solicitors, barristers, practitioners, judges generally, in articulating and deploying a philosophy of the liberal democratic state and the roles of parliament, the government and the judges within it. So he chose to give 16 lectures, primarily for final year undergraduates, on judicial review and the constitution, uh, distilling his lifetime's thinking on matters to which as a writer, as well as a judge, he had made distinctive contributions to our public law. They included parliamentary sovereignty, the interpretation of statutes and the importance of judicial independence in interpreting statutes as a basis for parliamentary sovereignty, the importance of the common law in constitutional development, the place of human rights in the constitution, the role of judicial review, how government and judiciary should understand and give appropriate respect to each other's different but equally legitimate roles in the governance of the nation, and the proper relationship between religious and other moral ideas and the law. Now the lectures were originally scheduled for four o'clock on Friday afternoons, uh, but John asked if they could be moved because that would have clashed with a regular congenial gathering of academic and support staff who happened to be in the faculty building, who uh, got together to unwind at the end of the week over a glass or two of wine. John didn't want to miss that. So instead his lectures were given at nine o'clock in the morning on Fridays, a time when few of us are at our best. Uh, he prepared his lectures with meticulous care and delivered them engagingly to an appreciative and very loyal audience. Um, and they gave his personal view of the constitution. It was personal. We in the audience particularly enjoyed his occasional aside along the lines of, and this is a point on which as far as I know, I have not yet been overruled by the House of Lords of the Supreme Court. Um, and then having given the lectures, he decided he would develop them into the book that we see, uh, we see before us, the constitutional balance. Um, unfortunately, his health deteriorated. Abel, as Nigel Fleming has uh, to, to uh, do something close to a completion of the text before he died. And that was largely, I have to say, thanks to the support of Nigel himself. Uh, after his death, Nigel and the editorial team at heart have brought the work to publication um, with the appreciation of him by Margaret Grace, which has been mentioned, and a foreword by Lord Newberg, uh, uh, and a sort of preface by Nigel and me. It's in many ways a very personal book. John's view of the good constitution is linked closely to his understanding of the human condition. And that I think was closely modeled on his own personality. He thought of people as essentially rational, enjoying free will, and so for that reason, being responsible for their actions and as being social beasts communicating with each other and having to find ways to coexist fairly with them. These characteristics demanded freedom of thought and expression and the rigorous rejection of all ideology, which he described, and I, I quote him, as a preconception or preconceptions, an assumption or assumptions not tested by reason, by argument, by practice or by results an a priori belief, given or imposed in advance, assumed to be true. That's his quotation. Now those, four, the, the, those ideologies foreclose debate about the good and um, they prevent reliance on reason and fair processes to conduct and resolve disagreements. 
For John, normative and descriptive theories alike have to be tested against the hard realities of life. They can't be accorded unquestioning or absolute acceptance. The fact that a god, dictator, parliament or church elder has been taken to have decreed something to be good, true or compulsory was never to be treated without independent moral justification as imposing an obligation to obey. John saw this as being at the heart of the common law method, the testing of every argument, every precedent, every principle, uh, by looking at it in the context of the facts of particular cases and trying to work out through rigorous argument uh, the best possible answers uh, are developed gradually over centuries and encapsulating for that reason reason, fairness, and he thought a presumption in favor of liberty. That was at the heart of what he thought of as the good constitution. But political decision-making too, he thought, was grounded on rationality, free speech, and the need for cohesion in democracies. Uh, unable to rely on revelation, people had to argue about and make their own laws but he saw the method of politics as being different from the method of the common law. The common law looks back in order to move forward, while politics typically relies on aims for or predictions of the future and employs consequentialist arguments uh, with electoral accountability for the success or failure of what's decided. But John thought that these had to be held in balance. He was a Democrat. He wasn't, as some people argued, a judicial supremacist. In fact, um, some of my uh, practitioner friends have said that he was not an easy judge to persuade that the executive had done anything unlawful. Perhaps because of his experience as treasury devil, he was always very conscious of the need to avoid imposing on ministers and civil servants standards or burdens which he thought would be unmanageable or impractical. Um, and so he saw the good constitution as involving a balance between these sets of goods, the two sets of goods, the backward-looking common lawyers approach and the forward-looking uh, executive and parliamentary approach. And he developed his uh, notion of deference, which with the discussion of his other uh, interests provides uh, a theme, a, a part of the spine of the argument of the book. The, uh, balance between them was fundamental. As he said, you should not give systematic priority to either the political or the uh, common law morality, but he sought a medium, and I quote, through which democracy and the rule of law become a unified force in the service of just government in a free polity. Um, I end quote there, and it was this medium, this, uh, as he said, the constitutional balance and the attitudes and actions needed to maintain it that form the uh, substance of much of this book. Um, he was not, however, by any means uncreative as a common lawyer. The, the um, things that he invented or developed through his judgments uh, and in his writings, such things as the um, uh, idea that some statutes have a constitutional status conferred by common law that protects them against implied amendment or repeal, the idea of common law constitutional rights and um, a number of other interesting uh, 
uh, judicial developments have influenced our public law uh, and the judgments of the Supreme Court in the Privacy International case last year, um, one of the most interesting but uh, difficult uh, cases that I've read since the Anis Minnick case to which it's a direct successor. Um, that shows, those judgments show just what an influence uh, John has had on our, uh, on our public law. So he was a common law man to his fingertips, but not a judicial suprem supremacist uh, and not in any way uh, anti-democratic. Um, the task of the judge and the politician, John thought, is to find a way of managing these uh, various uh, elements and particularly the two competing moralities uh, so as to allow the different moralities to work even when they are apparently in opposition to work uh, in a way that wasn't disharmonious and uh, it was his attempt to explain how to do that on the basis of his uh, lifetime's work and thinking that uh, we find running through um, the, the uh, balanced constitution. When I read the book, The Constitutional Balance, I hear it read, as it were, in his rich voice, speaking his elegant cadences, and I imagine him not in a Cambridge lecture room at nine o'clock on a Friday morning in winter, but as a more gentle and, and, uh, and congenial uh, place uh, at an annual conference of the European Group of Public Law, of which John was a founder member um, and an avid supporter throughout his life um, and is, coincidentally directed by Professor Spiridon Flogaitis, another former Goodhart professor who went on to publish the lectures that he gave as Goodhart professor. And I imagine John at a meeting in the warmth of a Greek autumn, which is when the group meets, holding the group's members wrapped in a discussion of some arcane area of European public law and then changing into a vibrantly colored shirt, typically colored with large parrots and palm trees and putting on a battered Panama before moving on with, some, with Sophie uh, and some friends to an island taverna for a leisurely meal, discussing law, ecclesiastical history, church architecture, the design of triremes, morality, Greek history and society, and much more over a glass or two of ouzo and a selection of Greek delicacies. But not all readers will have had that pleasant experience. And it seems to me, although once again, like Alison, I'm, in the, uh, I'm on the side of the pussies here. Um, I think anyone who reads this book will find it both enjoyable and be stimulated by it and stylish for reading. It's engaging, provocative and illuminating. And like Nigel, I think that it would be unfortunate if it didn't provoke a great deal of further discussion, debate and, uh, and inquiry. And now I have much pleasure in handing over to Lord Newberger. Th thank you, David. Um, long after most of his judicial contemporaries are forgotten, I think that John Laws will be remembered as an outstanding and reformative judge, professor, lecturer, and writer in the fundamentally important areas of constitutional and, and public law. And indeed, as, as David has explained, the common law generally. To a lawyer, that sounds very high praise indeed. And it certainly is. 
to a non-lawyer, it might sound pretty dry. Any non-lawyer who met John would not connect that dry summary with such a memorable and colorful person. At least in the last 20 years, physically, he presented as a rather roly-poly figure with thick floppy hair and engaging grin and piercing twinkling eyes sheltering behind rather thickly lensed spectacles. He also had a taste for, as, as Alison has said, for colorful, um, that's a kind word, I think, uh, even jarring ties, socks and braces, uh, and a marked fondness for cats. Much of this, including, as Alison has mentioned, a fondly held cat is very well captured in the photograph after the front page of the constitutional balance. For fond friends of John, I think this book is worth buying for the photograph alone. And John had many fond friends. When one met John socially, it didn't take long to appreciate his unusual combination of intellectual acuity, verbal fluency, moral probity and personal benevolence, spiced with an endearing sense of humour and mischief and a mild but unmistakable dose of eccentricity. He was the opposite of a snob. Socially, he treated everyone he talked to as his equal. Within a very short time of meeting him, every man, as Alison has said, irrespective of age, was my dear fellow or dear boy, and every woman, irrespective of age, was my dear girl. He loved intellectually challenging discussions, and he was also happy to indulge in small talk. In court, he dealt with advocates and colleagues, and not according to their status, but by reference to the impressiveness and intellectual rigor of what they said. In court and out of court, he always enjoyed a discussion and he could be relied on to conduct any debate with intellectual brilliance, verbal elegance and courteous good humor. And however strongly he felt about something, there was never any bitterness or side to the argument. He was without malice. The breadth of his knowledge and the depth of his thinking in legal and other intellectual areas was very impressive coupled with his erudition in philosophy, in history and classics, as you've been hearing, this all could have made him rather intimidating. But he was nothing of the kind. He had such a relaxed, gregarious, warm and unpretentious character. Although, as Alison has said, he didn't have self-doubt. He was devoid of arrogance, an unusual and admirable combination. Similarly, while he expressed his views confidently, he was always prepared to listen and was open, open to persuasion an ideal judge. I, I know from my many conversations with people rather younger than me and him, how fondly and gratefully John is remembered by so many former law students and pupils for the interest he showed in them, but also in the practical support which he gave to them, particularly in Inner Temple, where he was a devoted, committed bencher and a memorable treasurer. I think his commitments to bar students to legal education and to the legal community generally is very well demonstrated by the fact that for some 15 years, he was the formal visitor at Cumberland Lodge, which many of you will know is a residential educational establishment dedicated to academic work workshops and much used by all the inns of court for training young barristers. There was an unusual fearlessness about John as well, which was closely connected with his commitment to principle and his strong sense of morality. This manifests itself when he was at the bar, both in practice and in his private life. Alison has told us about the case which ended him up in the law reports, not as an advocate or as a judge, but as a litigant reported as laws and florin place in the All England Law Reports. But in court, it was the same. As another admirable judge, Stephen Sedley, explained in a lecture a few years ago, as a barrister, John placed the development of principled, a principled body of law ahead of the need to win a particular case. It's brave for any advocate to abandon an argument that might win the case, but John would always do so if winning the point would leave the law in an unsatisfactory state. He got credit in that case, at least. He received an the unusual accolade of a kind comment from Lord Bridge, who said in his judgment uh, that John had uh, got an eminently sensible and commendable attitude. While John had strong moral beliefs, he could not have been less of a Puritan or a prig. Quite the contrary, apart from enjoying social life and the odd drink, he, had, uh, he, 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 uh, he did have very high standards of intellectual 
more, he had very high intellectual moral standards, standards which he admirably stuck to, but he was tolerant and at times indulgent when it came to the foibles and inconsistencies of others. I quickly came to appreciate his personal qualities when we were colleagues in the Court of Appeal. While he was always focused and assiduous, any court with John on the bench had an ambiance which was stimulating and friendly. To, tho to those of us who had the privilege of being his judicial colleagues, he was a memorably stimulating, always generous companion in, in and out of court. In court, he treated the advocates and the litigants and indeed his judicial colleagues with courtesy, was never rude. While being addressed by an obtuse counsel, John was tolerant, uh, but to those who knew him, he obviously was unimpressed, but that didn't necessarily come across uh, to the barrister concerned. And whenever he had points to make, he made them clearly and listened to the answers, whether he was making the points to counsel in court or to his colleagues outside court. He relished being contradicted and there was nothing he liked better, whether in court or out of court, than an intellectual argument, which as socially he conducted with good humor and a total lack of rancor. So far as his assiduity is concerned, I do recall a rather small incident just after I'd sat with John on an appeal in 2005. The next day I was in the same courtroom with other judges on a different appeal. And in that second appeal, I happened to be sitting in the chair that John had occupied the day before. I picked up what I thought was my notebook, and on opening it, I discovered it was John's notebook from the day before. I still remember being overwhelmingly impressed by the full, accurate, and well-expressed note that John had made of the earlier hearing, not only of what had been said, but adding comments of his own, all perceptive, all written in clear handwriting. During the whole of that time, he appeared to be wholly focused on presiding over and engaging in oral argument. Particularly to someone such as me, who's incapable of taking a coherent note, which even he can read, John's notes were remarkably impressive and somewhat uh, depressing. Given the importance of his contributions in and out of court to the development of the law and the scintillating way in which they were expressed, I feel it's only right to let John speak a bit more for himself. A searcher for delightfully phrased expressions of important principles in John's writing, in and out of court, is faced with an ombre de richesse. I've just chosen three short passages about different aspects of the law in which John was especially interested. In the prestigious Hamlin Lectures of 2013, where he discussed the constitutional balance appropriately, John's view of the nature and function of the practice of law was brilliantly expressed. We've heard from Alison how he saw advocacy as alchemy, and this is what he said about law. Not a science, for its purpose is not to find out natural facts. It is an art as architecture is an art. Its function is practical, but it's enhanced by such qualities as elegance, economy, and clarity. The law has two practical purposes. First, to require, forbid, or penalize forms of conduct between citizen and citizen and citizen and state. Secondly, to provide formal rules for classes of human activity whose fulfillment would otherwise be confused, uncertain, or ineffective. And then, somewhat earlier in the 1998 Witham case, at first instance, Mr. Justice Laws said this, in the unwritten legal order of the British state, at a time when the common law continues to accord a legislative supremacy to parliament, the notion of a constitutional right can in my judgment inhere only in this proposition, that the right in question cannot be abrogated by the state, save by specific provision in an act of parliament or by regulations whose varies in main legislation specifically confers the power to abrogate. Not for the first time, John had the unusual accolade of having a first instance judgment he had written, cited in the UK top courts as representing the law, and remarkably in no fewer than six subsequent House of Lords or Supreme Court cases. The final extract I want to read is in a dissenting judgment he gave in the Court of Appeal in the 2009 Wood case, concerned with the right of privacy which John described as the personal autonomy of every individual. Uh, 
which he went on to describe in brilliant terms, this cluster of values summarized as the personal autonomy of every individual and taking concrete form as a presumption against interference with the individual's liberty is the defining characteristic of a free society. And he added this, we therefore need to preserve it even in little cases. Six years later in the Supreme Court, Lord Tilson and Lord Clark each cited and agreed with John's dissenting judgment. Indeed, Lord Tilson set out an extensive passage from John's judgment, including the extract I've just quoted, saying that he had done so, and I quote, because I agree with it and cannot improve on it. Can I end my tribute to this remarkable judicial figure by addressing something of a metaphorical elephant in the virtual room? I've referred more than once to the very high quality of John's judgments in terms of both content and style. I've referred more than once to the remarkable degree of enthusiastic approval which John's judgments have received from numerous judges in the UK's top court. The question to which this inevitably gives rise is why did this remarkable figure not get there in person? Various explanations have been given that I've heard, but I'm unpersuaded that any of them is remotely justified. I've no satisfactory answer to the question, other than to say that chance has a substantial influence on all events and issues in life, a much greater influence than most of us like to admit. I'm afraid that Shakespeare's slings and arrows of outrageous fortune play a significant part in judicial careers, just in other areas of life. While disappointed, John accepted his undeserved non-promotion with all the graciousness and good humor that anyone who knew him would have, predict would have predicted. I hope that he consoled himself with the thought that he made as great a contribution from the Court of Appeal to English public and constitutional law as Lord Denning made to English private law in the previous judicial generation. And John did so with at least as much benevolence and with at least as much panache as Lord Denning. John was a great man, a great thinker and a great judge. Thank you very much. I pass the baton back to Nigel. Thank you, David. Thank you also for three wonderful contributions. We have had a, a couple of, of questions and comments. One that started quite earlier with a correction to my introduction. I introduced David David Newberger as the first president of the Supreme Court. My, my error, uh, he was the second president. And my apologies to Lord Phillips. During 2009 to 2012, uh, David Newberg was rather busy being the master of the roles. So having- can I, can I interrupt that on a point that John Laws might be quite amused by where he here. Nigel has taken the blame on himself. He in fact put the introduction past me and I approved it with that mistake in it without noticing it. Sorry to interrupt, Nigel. I'm very pleased you did. Uh, and <laughs> now I'm completely embarrassed. And I, I've got, one question but before I before I do, I've looked at the, the contributions on the Q and A, and there's one bit I wanted to read out, which ends up with a question. As I read John's elegant prose, I could almost hear his voice and joie de vivre. That and his charm came out in all that he did, from the events he organised in his year as treasurer of the Inner Temple, his engagement in legal conferences, particularly if they were in Greece and the efficient but always courteous way he dispatched business in court. And then there's a question, and it's for David Feldman, but anybody else who wants to contribute. Uh, the reference, David, is to your 2013 article in the LQR, uh, when you were critical of John's linkage of constitutional status to fundamental rights. And the question is, why has that concept remained so under-analyzed by the courts since then? I'm not sure. I mean, John, <clears throat> John recognized, uh, and I think in, in the constitutional balance, he mentions in a, a footnote that th there has been some criticism of, of that on the basis that his um, approach to constitutional statutes was in different ways, both over-inclusive and under-inclusive. Um, but I, I think the problem is that uh, courts are, are in a very difficult position if they have to try to make either a, a complete list of constitutional statutes uh, or a uh, 
principle or, or, or definition under which one could um, conclusively classify a statute or even a, a provision within a statute as being um, either constitutional or um, ordinary. And so I think it's much easier for, 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 for courts, um, although the others may be in a better position, are in a better position than I am to say whether this is right. It's much easier for, for, for judges just to seize on um, particular statutes that seem to be unquestionably constitutional um, rather than try to uh, theorize the, um, the, the background um, underpinnings of the idea. Thank you, thank you, David. Unless anybody else wants to contribute, I was going to move to the next uh, comment on, on, on the Zoom Q&A. Very conscious that Alison has cleverly positioned her camera so that it shows the time in the background. So I'm um, conscious that we have not very many Nigel, that's the clock I look at before I go to court. So it is five minutes ahead of time. Yeah. This is a, not a question, but a memory. Uh, and let me read it out and, and share it with you. John was uh, the visitor of Cumberland Lodge in Windsor Great Park. And like his predecessor, Princess Margaret, John interpreted the role not so much in terms of providing oversight or dealing with disputes with the wisdom of Solomon, but as having open invitation to drop in for a visit. This he did, so often accompanied by Sophie. The last time they came here together, they spent a weekend with our Cumberland Lodge scholars, a group of doctoral students from across the UK. John and Sophie were in their element, enjoying the company of young people and engaging with them in intellectual discussions. We greatly miss their visits. And um, one more. I'm reading them first, make sure I've got it right. Uh, this is addressed to Lord Newberger, uh, asking the question, which court or parliament would be the metaphysical elephant opined as the highest court in the United Kingdom? If parliament is the highest court of the land, that is the decision of parliament and the laws enacted are the highest laws of the land, how would the UK constitution fit a bicameral executive branch of government? I'm, I was going to ask, uh, offer to answer that myself, but realise it was beyond my pay grade. David. Um, I'm not sure it's entirely um, uh, uh, up to, uh, whether I'm up to that pay grade either. Um, Parliament is technically a court, it's quite true, but we don't see it as part of the judiciary. Indeed, if we did, um, we would all be uh, confused. Um, I think that in terms of analyzing the British constitution, one starts off with the fact that it's evolved rather than been created as a coherent whole in a typically common law way. And therefore to analyze it in too careful or precise a way or principled a way will tend to lead to problems. Like when they got rid of the Lord Chancellor and the old fashioned type. Uh, on the grounds of the need to have separation of powers and then realize that politically the last thing they wanted was separation of powers because logically that would involve all ministers leaving parliament. We, we live in a somewhat confused system and so if this answer sounds, sounds somewhat confused um, it maybe fits the common law principle but I think in the end a bicameral system is entirely workable with our common law system. Indeed, uh, our common law system has been developed since um, we had two houses of parliament as uh, under the aegis of a, a, a bicameral system. So I see no problem in that connection. But um, certainly until 2009, uh, our top court was part of the bicameral system. Technically, it was part of the House of Lords. In practice, the judges, I'm glad to say, were as independent of the political House of Lords as the Supreme Court is, but the perception was different. Thank you, David. Could I, could I read out and share another memory? John will be particularly fondly remembered and missed by everyone who has attended a Bar European Group conference. 
He gave a superb and genuinely hilarious dinner speech every year relating to whichever city the conference was held in, for which all the historical material was provided by his, quote, beloved researcher, Sophie, and always including, and this I'm very pleased to read out, and always including his classic Clive Lewis passport story. Nothing more is said about the Clive Lewis passport story. We'll have to wait. And one final contribution, they're beginning to stream in now, but the reason I'll stop, I'll explain in a moment. Uh, and that is, uh, I'm not sure if I can pick up a question. No, I think they're all uh, comments and perhaps best left for uh, the next stage. Could I say thank you to everybody for their contributions online and also for those who have spoken uh, in this webinar. Uh, it, it might assist or inform people to know that the respect for John and the interest in his works is perhaps reflected by the number of participants. If this had been a, a, um, a drink and a, a nibble and a book launch, that there may have been 30 or 40 people uh, with the quality of our sandwiches that would have gone up to 50 or 60. But here we've just gone way over 200, which is quite remarkable. I opened um, the event by saying that virtual isn't as good as uh, having a, 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 a meeting in person. And one of the reasons uh, I've stopped reading out the contributions is I've spoken to um, those in chambers and we have decided that there will be an in-person face-to-face debate on the constitutional balance and the themes running through it at the end of this year or early 2022. And we will be in touch. I hope that many can then get together and share some memories. But I hope the, the four of us, particularly the three main speakers, have managed to paint at least parts of the picture. And for those who knew John, brought back some memories. Having listened to uh, David Newberger referring to John's writings, I thought I might close the event, if everybody wouldn't mind, by reading one short passage from the Constitutional Balance. It, it for me, summarizes or encapsulates the elegance of John's writing. And he says this, this is on page 12, right at the end of the introduction, so before he gets into the meat of what follows. I do not claim to discover or articulate the best constitution. That postulates a political Elysian field where every question is finally resolved and further inquiry has no purpose. In the sphere of moral and political values, the notion that there is nothing left to argue about is as arrogant as it is depressing, a bilious mixture. Such a vision recalls John Donne's dreadful picture of heaven, where there shall be no darkness nor dazzling, but one equal light, no noise nor silence, but one equal music, no fears nor hopes, but one equal possession, no ends nor beginnings, but one equal eternity, a place where nothing ever changes, hell, not heaven. We could celebrate the fact that there is so much more to discover that we are not the masters of the universe. The good constitution can be no more than the best we can presently envisage, given that we presently know of it, the human condition. Yes. Goodbye and hope to see you all soon.